Welcome back to another episode of Virus Sports Talk. Uh, let me just be first to say, sorry for the long hiatus uh, with basketball season and being a coach. It takes a lot of my time, uh, so research wasn't able to be done. Certain things weren't able to be done, and yeah, and especially with moving in, as you can see, you can see one of the windows because of how I'm angled right now, because. The room's filling out, or filling out, and we'll, maybe once it's all done that we might do a walkthrough, but it's not quite done yet. Uh, apparently today was 52 weeks since starting podcasting for fun. Uh, I noticed that today, um... Don't want to get into the discussion of that. That's a discussion for another time, and more than likely not for a public setting. Anyways, so let me just get down to it. This is Byro Sports Talk. Uh, since it's been a while, I talk about it all. I love sports. I love just being able to bring some of my sports knowledge to you guys. Yes, I am need a haircut <laughs> so let's get started so let's start with the easy so the NFL first off let's just say congratulations to the Eagles they won uh, personally I'll be honest with you I thought the Patriots were gonna win I thought the Eagles would have had it next year but with them winning this year I think it's Yes, they're the front runners still, just like the Patriots to make it next year. I just think with them winning it this year, there's going to be so many other things going wrong for them, which could be Alshon Jeffrey going down with injury, Zach Ertz going down with injury. But with me saying that, hopefully that does not happen, and hopefully they'll have another great year as they did this year. Um, so what's next? Uh, for the Eagles, it's... Getting Carson Wentz back for the Patriots, it's figuring out what went wrong. Uh, even today, there was a report about Malcolm Butler <laughs> and why he didn't play. He knew leading up, according to Devin McCourty, that he knew going into the game that he wasn't going to play. So, take it as it is. We'll have to figure it out and move on. Um, coming weeks. So... Yeah, smile because it's all familiar to me. Uh, within the coming weeks, weekly, I will probably do... I'm going to do four teams. Uh, let's do each division. So one week a division, the following week of division, leading up to the draft, which will be a live show. Uh, definitely will also have a Q&A on Wednesdays again. I really enjoyed that, especially when Wayne Harpster, my cousin, started commenting, asking some questions about the Bengals. Uh, well, actually, that's what I wanted to bring up real quick. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whew. Uh, let's get down to it. Let me look for it. I want to make sure I have this correct question. Yeah, right there. That looks about right, right? Yeah, that's it. So, his question during it was, what key positions do the Bengals need to fill in the offseason to make it to the playoffs? And maybe even make it past the first playoff game. Thoughts? Well, I did comment this, but I would like to also repeat it on here. I think the Bengals need to start with the line. So, the biggest concern this year was keeping Andy Dalton off his back. Uh, I say this... Because I did go to a Bengals-Bears game. The Bears got to Andy Dalton almost every time. Uh, Andrew Whitworth, who signed with the Rams, helped turn around the Rams this year. Because a good offensive line leads to good offense, which leads to open runs, which leads to uh, open passes. <laughs> it opens up the offense. I will also say they did end up 7-9, which is always good for the Bengals. Uh, 
The thing they're missing is Mohamed Sanu and Marvin Jones Jr., though. Because with Green and Eifert, they just aren't being healthy anymore. You need those second, third strings to be able to come up with big plays. Uh, let's see. They are a good team. Uh, I say they are a good team as in they have players that could probably get them to playoffs. They need that special player, though. Uh, Andy Dalton could, probably could be that player if he's confident enough again. Uh, AJ McCarron's probably going to move on. That was a big one coming up. Especially now that he won his uh, unrestricted free agency lawsuit. So, if you look at the games they lost this year, they lost to the Texans when they were at their best, they lost to the Steelers twice. They lost to the Bears, but the Bears did sweep all the AFC North teams. Uh, loss to the Vikings, the Titans, the Jaguars, and then they lost to the Packers. So, let's see. Steelers twice, playoff team. Vikings, Titans, Jaguars. Five of their seven, or five of their nine, sorry. That would leave the Texans, the Packers. And the Bears, that's off by one somewhere. Oh, Steelers beat them twice, duh. So, eight teams beat them. Uh, three were not playoff teams, but the Packers were... Had Aaron Rodgers at the time. Uh, the Bears, again, swept the AFC North. Uh, and the Texans were at their best at the beginning of the year when they lost to the... Or, or when the Bengals lost to them. Uh, so if you look at this team, they just lost the playoff teams, and that's why they were out. If they would have, say, upset the Steelers, they'd be 8-8, eight eight, but if they would have, like, you know, beat the Titans or the Jaguars, they would have slipped in and not the Jaguars or the Titans. So there's always improvement. Uh, I think it's just a down year uh, for you Bengals fans. Uh, do I think they'll improve? Depends how they draft. It all comes down to how they draft and how they do do in free agency. Uh, but like I was getting at before I re-answered the question at my last Q&A, which was whew, a month ago. Shocker. Uh, the, I just wanted to discuss about the Bengals. And as I said, I will do a division each week, starting here on out, to try to lengthen these. Uh, I'm also trying to talk more. I know I'm a very straight to the point person. <laughs> so it is what it is, guys. Yeah, uh, these segments aren't Q and A. Uh, Q and A's will be Wednesdays. I like to keep saying that it is a Facebook Live Q and A. Uh, if I like your questions, I'll bring them up on here. Uh, but please comment. I would have you call in, but there's no point. <laughs> so, next, the NCAA. What was their recruiting like this year? So, you know, that. Uh, ooh. Sorry. So, as I pull this up, again, uh, again, I'm going to try back to weekly, uh, make it bi-weekly with the Wednesday q and I think that would be most beneficial for me and for you. Helps me learn a little bit. Helps, you know, it helps either way. Now, let's see, where is the rankings? There we go. That's what I want. Give me those rankings. All right. So final recruit rankings. You got Georgia, number one. Ohio State, two. Texas, three. Penn State, four. Clemson, five. Others of note, you have Alabama, USC, Miami, Notre Dame, and Oklahoma finishing the top ten. Uh, 
After the top 10, you got Florida State, three SEC teams, and then Washington. Those three SEC teams are Auburn, Florida, LSU. Uh, next, Tier 5, Texas A&M, Oregon, South Carolina, UCLA, and Michigan. Michigan having only 20 commits. That's a very low number, just like Clemson's 17. But on the high numbers, you have Texas, Notre Dame, UCLA, Virginia Tech, uh, Ohio State, and Georgia both have 26, hence why they're so high. Uh, because I like to look through this, surprising one to me, Duke at number 61, and they only had 16. Ouch. 14 for Stanford at 38. But, you know, that's just how it is. That's how it's going to be. Uh... <laughs> I mean, looking at it, it is what it is. Uh, Georgia did a lot to transfer people. I'm sorry if you hear my dog. <laughs> I don't know why he's barking. But, let's see. I don't need standings. That's my bad. Uh, so trying to pull up the way too early rankings because you know they always have the way too early rankings where are they aha found it so staying atop the way too early rankings is Clemson uh, why they had a good solid recruit uh, they were a great team this year again just like they have been I mean yeah they lost to Bama but they're once again in place to run the table in that ACC. Number two, Bama. Uh, the biggest key with Bama, I think, coming this year is you have Jalen Hurts and you also have the, oh, where's his name? Uh, let me see if I can find his name so I can say it properly. Don't see it, but you have the quarterback that stepped in in the second half. He was tremendous. I don't know why his name lost me. It will probably come later on in the segment. Uh, Georgia's number three, especially with a nice number one recruiting to class. However, they do lose a lot, a lot of defensive talent. They do lose their bread and butter in the run game, but... With a year under his belt, the quarterback should be a lot better. One of the favorite teams I am excited, and I know this is a homer thing, so bear with me. I'm excited to see how Ohio State bounces back this year. And I say that because J.T. Barrett will not be the quarterback. I repeat, will not be the quarterback. Now, who would I like to see? I, they say Dwayne Haskins is the lead, but Tate Martell is trying to push it. I would love to see the kid from Athens, Joe Burrows, get a shot. If not, I would like to see him go home, but again, that's being a homer. <laughs> but he it, again, it's what it is. Moral of life, it is what it is. Uh, Tate Martell is just going to get that option. And if they want to keep having that option offense where the quarterback can run or hand it off, Tate Martell is probably the best. Oklahoma's five, Washington's six, Wisconsin's intriguing seven, Miami eight, Michigan State nine, Penn State ten, Michigan 11. Man. So I'm looking at this, and that's just through 11, and you see a lot of Big Ten. And they, for some reason, the RPI, I think it was, hates the Big Ten, but yet here we are with like five in the top 11. Let's see, Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan State, Wisconsin, Michigan. Yep, five and 11. <laughs> so Wisconsin, Auburn, Virginia Tech. Trying to see if there's any like surprises. TCU, USC, Florida State, 
just going in order. Boise State's always getting an early. Mississippi State, again, not too much of a surprise. Notre Dame, not too much of a surprise. UCF, after being disrespected, is ranked now, yeah. LSU, Texas, and I think 25, nope, South Carolina. So, no surprises with that top 25. Uh, it's going to change, of course, throughout the summer because of injuries and other things, transfers, uh, early enrollees. But as of right now, that's how it stands. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the Olympics. Yeah, I'm an Olympic guy. Uh, surprisingly, I haven't watched this one that much. Uh, it's kind of what's, what's happened for me. <laughs> but let's. I have the current medal count in the 2014 medal count, just to compare. So, in 2018, currently Norway leading the way with 28 total medals. Germany at 20, Canada at 17, Netherlands at 13, Olympic athletes of Russia 11, because Russia is banned this year, <laughs> but they're the Olympic athletes of Russia. And of course the USA at 10 with five gold medals. And I did keep track of the gold medals for us because that's all some people care about. Now back in 2014, you had total medals, Norway, 26, so they already improved. Germany had 19, they also improved. Canada had 25, They're, they still have time to get some medals. Uh, the Netherlands had 24, you know. The Olympic athletes of Russia had 29. That's an 18 medal loss, that's a huge loss for them. But then again, as the home country back in 2014, you have more athletes. Uh, USA finished second that year in 2014 behind Russia with 28. Yes. And they had nine gold medals, which they already are halfway there. Not bad. Uh, again, I'm going to keep cheering for the US of A, keep cheering for Hungary because of the last name. And, you know, that's just how it is. It's going to go how it's going. Uh, to the NBA. So the big NBA news of late, uh, a few night or last night was the NBA All Star Game. The team LeBron won, won. I think it was one forty eight. Correct. Let me double check. One forty eight. It's not gonna show me, of course. Yep, one forty eight to one forty five, and. Before I talk about the rest of the way, let's talk about these trades, shall we? And yes, I would love to talk about these trades. So. Oh, uh, man, was that too... I don't think that was two weeks ago, but yeah, that's what they're giving me. Um, Let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to... There it is, trade deadline. So... The trade deadline. There's certain trades I want to talk about because it's what I need to talk about. So first off, Dwayne Wade being traded to the Heat for a heavily protected second round pick. Um, it's pretty much just the Cavs being like, "Hey, we don't want you anymore. Go play for the Heat." That's that's the gist of that trade. Uh, another trade they did, Cleveland acquires Rodney Hood and George Hill from the Jazz and the Kings, respectively. It's part of the three-team trade. The Kings will get Joe Johnson, I'm on Schumpert, and a 2020 second-round pick via Miami, while Utah receives Jay Crowder and Derrick Rose. Now, it's a great they're just getting rid of old talent. The Dre, Jay Crowder just wasn't fitting with the Cavs, and I understand he's a hardworking player. And what I mean by hardworking player is uh, LeBron's got to be the workhorse there. Uh, 
if LeBron's not the workhorse, there's issues. And Jay Crowder is a workhorse also, but he works better in a everyone's working hard environment, not just LeBron James working hard. Not saying other guys aren't working hard. It comes off that way, but... I mean, they have been struggling a lot this year, and it's starting to show of the age. Uh, the other trade that was huge for them was Isaiah Thomas getting traded with Channing Fry and a first-round pick to the Lakers for Jordan Clarkson and Larry Nance Jr. Uh, the significance of that is Isaiah Thomas just got back from injury, and he got traded. Uh, Jordan Clarkson and, well, not Jordan Clarkson. Larry Nance Jr., a uh, father, played for the Cavs and pretty much said, thank you, L.A., but I'm coming home now. And that's just a nice way of they of them saying, or him welcoming the new challenges here. Uh, as of the standings and what to expect moving forward, Right now you have the Raptors 1, Celtics 2, Cavs 3, uh, Wizards 4, Pacers 5, Bucks 6, six sorry, 76 years 7, and the Heat 8, with the Pistons at 9. Um, looking up and down, do I think the Pistons sneak in? I It's hard for me to say the Pistons sneak in. Excuse me, but it requires me to pick a team to fall out. And the closest team to falling out would be the Heat. And if I had to choose a team, I think the Heat would be that team that falls out. So I'm going to predict the Heat fall out, the Pistons are in. But of course, those seedings, four through seven, will vary. Uh, I do think the Celtics will be the one seed. I mean, they went through a rough patch, patch this last 10 games, 5-5. Five and five. However, I think that'll help them moving forward. The Raptors are loving it right now, being the one seed. They control the destiny, especially if the Celtics have to face the Cavs, who I think have the third seed. Lockdown. Do I think they can push for that second seed? They have a lot of ground to make up. And they have 56 games under their belts. They have 26 games to make up. Could they? Yeah, but the Celtics will have to collapse. And I think the Celtics are going to fight to get that one seed. So... Other than that, that's how kind of how I see the East. I think the Knicks will keep improving. Uh, the Bulls will improve a little bit. But your Nets, your Magic, your Hawks, they're still down. The Hornets, they didn't get what they wanted, which was a hard reboot with Kembe Walker. And we'll see how that plays out over summer. Now, the Western Conference. Ooh, the Western Conference. You have your Rockets right now, and the ones... Spot. You have your Warriors in the two spot. Only down half a game. The Spurs are three. The T-Wolves are four. The Thunder, five. Nuggets, six. Trailblazers, seven. Eight are the Pelicans. And the Clippers are a surprising ninth. And I say that all encouragement. Now, looking at this. The Jazz are right now riding a 11-game win streak. You heard that right, 11-game win streak. Another team riding a big win streak, the Rockets. Now, both teams, do I see them making playoffs? I'm going to say yes for the Rockets because they're the one seed. <laughs> it would be very... Uh, a good word. A very uneducated guess to say they don't. But they will make it. The Clippers, or Clippers, I don't think will make it. I think they will just miss out. The Jazz. Do I think they overcome? Sorry. A Nuggets or a Trailblazer? Do I think they overcome one of those teams? 
I'm. I don't think the Jazz will do it. I think this nice eleven game win streak will be the highlight of the year. Because looking at these Utah Jazz, they're twelve and nineteen on the road. The only team right now in playoff contention that has a worse road record are the Nuggets. I mean, you have a 12 and 18 Timberwolves or 13 and 18 Spurs, but 9 and 19 on the road, that's really bad. Really, really, really bad. So, 12 and 19 is not good either. You got to think will they make it up? It's very well the Nuggets could just this is their plateau and they just go down cuz looking at their offense and defense only separated by like 1.1 point differential. The Jazz a 1.8. That's a lot better. <laughs> but you got to also figure out who you're beating. And one of the keys to the Jazz beating is they're beating good teams. They beat the Spurs, they beat the Trailblazers, they beat the Grizzlies, they beat the Pelicans, they beat the Spurs, they beat the Warriors, they beat the Pistons, I mean, and the Raptors. They are beating good teams in this stretch. Now, you could say, argue, hey, it's right before the All-Star break, a lot of teams might be resting guys, which I think, if I remember correctly, some are. And some of you might also say, well, Byro, the Grizzlies are terrible this year. Eh, they are. But they're still always a hard game. But in looking at everything, you got to think, what helps the team make playoffs? And I think defense is going to help. And looking at everything, I think the Jazz have a better chance than say the Nuggets. I think the Nuggets are high as a six seed currently, and I think they'll drop once reality set in. Trailblazers, I think they'll prevail just because of the offensive firepower they're possessing. The Pelicans are an intriguing team, and I think right now the Pelicans are a poor man's version of the Clippers years ago. You have Anthony Davis, who can do it all. Blake Griffin. You have DeMarcus Cousins, who's better than what DeAndre Jordan used to be. Uh, you have Drew Holiday, who is nowhere in comparison to a Chris Paul. You also have a Rondo. But... Can they sustain their success through to the playoffs? I don't know. I like the Jazz making it. I still think the Nuggets are the team that come out. But do the Clippers make it? I don't know. I don't know. I just don't see them having the firepower. But yet, if you compare the two conferences, there's a lot more talent in that West than there is in that East. So, my predictions aren't much different than who's there. I would love to see the 76ers in that playoffs for the first time in a long time and winning the process. But let's move on. So, moving on to my favorite of all subjects the NCAA basketball now it's been about a half hour yeah which is what I like to aim for this one was going to be longer anyways because of all the topics I missed and what I want to talk about so let's start with my biggest surprises this year and I have two only because it's once again being a homer uh, Ohio State is a big surprise they were not expected to be a ranked team ever this year and here they are contending for the conference title 
Now losing to Michigan this weekend might has made them fall from contention, but who knows? They could still pull it out in the tournament. But again, they are a big surprise. The Weston boys, uh, what's the name? Kate's Diop, I think is how it goes. But they're they're just doing oh Bates Diop, sorry Bates Diop. And Ohio State is doing great this year. Uh, my second surprise is only because of my own expectations. Ohio's fall. They have a lot more losses than wins this year. And when I look at that Mac, Akron is in the same exact boat. And you just don't see that from those two schools. But that's why it's a short topic. It's just... Me not understanding, I mean, I do understand our starting point guard transferred to Michigan. And when I watched Michigan the other during the other week, he didn't even play. So I don't know if he plays now. I hope so, especially since he transferred. But moving on, my top four teams as of right now, Virginia, Michigan State, Duke, Villanova, Purdue is my next team in. Why? Because Purdue's been great this year. Uh, haven't seen much of Xavier to have them in. And I think that would be it. It might be Kansas in front of Purdue in the actual rankings, but looking at that Big 12, I'm not impressed. Not impressed. Anyone can beat anyone. And that comes up with the favorite topic of March Madness. What to expect this year? So... Expecting chaos. I expect a lot of chaos this year. Uh, a team to make it all the way. That's that's going to be tough, guys. Uh, I think a Duke has the talent to make it, but yet they've lost some easy games, in my opinion. Uh, a team like Purdue and Virginia have great chances. Especially Virginia, uh, just defense, dude. That's all that matters. Talent, as they've been good these past few years, they've been getting the talent too. And that's what matters. Uh, Villanova, another good team. Michigan State, always good. You always can count on them. But again, Michigan State's been upset before, and they've also ran the tables before. What to expect? Uh, chaos. It's March Madness. Uh, it's coming around the corner. It's the f best time of the year. Um, and with that, this has been another episode of Byra Sports Talk. I will see you next time, guys, on Wednesday for the live Q&A. See ya. You burn me up, you burn me up.